Hello and welcome to Occupy Thoughts, a podcast brought to you by the Foundation for Middle East Peace. I'm Lara Friedman. I'm the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Today is Thursday, August 18th, 2022. And I'm, I'm very happy, although happy is a weird word to use today. I'm very happy to have with me, though, my friend and colleague, Omar Shaker. And Omar is the Israel and Palestine Director at Human Rights Watch. Hello will be posted with this podcast. Um, for folks who follow the Occupied Thoughts podcast, you may remember that Omar joined me for a conversation last October, October 26, 2021, to be exact. And again, I'll post a link to that um, to share his insights on Israel's announcement the previous week uh, that it was designating six prominent uh, human rights NGOs, Palestinian human rights NGOs, um, as terrorist organizations. And that podcast is part of a body of resources that the Foundation for Middle East Peace produced around that time. There's a resource page where all of that stuff lives. And again, I'll also put a link to that with this podcast, which brings us to where we are today. So, you know, the past 10 months, these designations haven't really been in the news. Um, and I think a lot of us are, are being sort of watching them and concerned, but it hasn't been headline news really much at all until now. So now 10 months later, and and I wanted to say, what we're talking today, we're sitting here, we're at the height of an Israeli elections campaign. We're uh, at a time in the US when Israel is directly challenging the Biden administration on Iran diplomacy. Um, that's news today. And it's at a time when Israel has become a key factor in US politics and US primary elections, and it's set to become a, a key factor in upcoming um, midterm elections where it's no doubt gonna be weaponized. So at this moment, here we are, Israel has now doubled down on those designations, first with a statement yesterday afternoon, Israel time, um, by the Israeli Minister of Defense, uh, who, by the way, is the minister who is the de facto sovereign over the entire West Bank, which is held under Israeli military law, um, followed by raids at dawn this morning inside Palestine the territory in Ramallah, the areas that are basically entirely controlled theoretically by Palestinian rule, um, against, uh, I believe, all six of the NGOs, plus one other that wasn't even on the designations list. So that brings us to where we are today. So Omar, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Lara. And uh, and and Omar has let me know, I didn't know this when I asked him, he's actually in Prague, so he, he's not even in a good time zone. He's being very generous this time, and we're, we're very grateful. So Omar, let's first remind people very briefly how we got where we are before we dig into the what's happening now. So can you briefly recap what happened last October with the initial designations, which I'm going to quote, human rights called that at the time, an appalling and unjust decision, which is an attack by the Israeli government on the international human rights movement. Yeah, so I think, you know, the October decision, um, of course, is the sort of starting point in this journey, though we should, of course, note that this was a part of a decades long um, set of efforts by the Israeli government to in particular um, muzzle uh, Palestinian civil society organizations. Of course, there are, um, it's part of efforts to also uh, put pressure on Israeli and international advocates. But uh, in October 22nd of 2021, uh, the Israeli government designated six of Palestine's premier civil society organizations. That includes Al Haq, um, Al Bisan, Adlamir, Defense for Children in International Palestine, the Union of Agricultural Work Committees, and the Union of, um, of Women's Committees um, as terrorist organizations under Israeli law. Um, they followed that up two weeks later with a corresponding move um, in the West Bank that declared those groups to be unlawful associations, meaning that that would uh, you know, provide the force of law in the West Bank for them to take further action against the organizations. There are well over 400 Palestinian organizations that have been similarly designated, including the seventh group that you mentioned in your introduction, which had been previously uh, designated, I believe, in 2020 as an unlawful um, association. So these orders were um, provincial in a sense under Israeli law. So they, um, you know, so so although they were put in place, there was some mechanism that was provided for groups to challenge that designation. And in essence, um, you know, different actions were taken because theoretically you have two different orders that were in place. Um, so the, you know, um, 
Five of those organizations challenged the West Bank designation, and uh, you know, three challenged the designation, you know, within Israel proper. And the decision that was issued yesterday uh, rejected the challenge in the West Bank. So, in essence, uh, the military commander, you know, which obviously goes up to to, to, to Minister Gantz, uh, there confirmed, uh, made permanent the uh, unlawful association designation um, and the raids and the uh, were then issued in addition to raids of course closure orders were issued so when the army wants to effectuate um, a designation of unlawful association they issue a closure order so theoretically what that means is that the organization is ordered shut so of course the groups were in their offices today and continuing to do their vital work and so they're again in violation of that order providing further other grounds for the Israeli army to then take subsequent steps. Separately, with regards to the terrorism designations within Israel, it was ruled again by Defense Minister Gantz because, you know, uh, they're, they're the decision makers on this one, that the three groups that did not challenge that designation, that ruling was confirmed. And of course, there remain ongoing challenges with uh, three of the remaining, you know, organizations. So of course, there's been a lot in the background that's been happening in terms of we can get to in terms of who said what and criticisms and reporting and all that. But in terms of purely the timeline of these designations, I think those that that's sort of how we went from October to August of 2022. Thanks. That, that's really helpful. And for people who are listening, I think it's it's just important to emphasize, and if you want to comment on this, when we talk about law as it applies to Palestinians in the West Bank, we're talking here not of rule of law, but rule by law, whether it is military orders, which don't even have a pretense of any sort of democratic basis or accountability to the people being ruled, or whether you're talking about Israeli law, where you literally have a sovereign country implementing laws over a non-sovereign territory that they control over people who are not citizens. And this is where people end up using words like apartheid um, you know, to, to describe that. So there's a, there's a real um, there's a real problem using the word law and, and, and this is framed as you know, everything is legal when you get to make the laws to do what you want. Um, but I think that's important because when someone hears, well, three of the organizations didn't challenge, you know, if I, I think I will try to get on, on a podcast in the next few days or a week or something, some of the people involved in, in the legal aspects of this. But I remember conversations last October where there was this real question of do we even bother challenging it, which only would seem to legitimize the process by which these orders are being um, are being laid down with the knowledge that no matter what we do, they're going to be validated. Right. That 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 was sort of the understanding of everyone that the whole the process of challenging was not going to be successful in any case. Yeah, I mean, I would say a couple of things just to add to that, Laura. I mean, one is the groups demanded to see the material that was relied upon to make this determination. And in essence, the Israeli government said that's secret. So the groups basically said, you know, we aren't being given due process or the right to a basic defense. So how can we even engage in this process? And that's not to know, as you noted, that these processes lack any legitimacy. I mean, we know when it comes to military courts that these new data was published recently by the Israeli newspaper Haaretz about the percentage of conviction rates, you know, in military courts, and it it, it gets very close to 100%, uh, you know, of convictions. And, and, and we know that these are not uh, legitimate processes. So again, when you have a decision to declare, and let's take a step back and recall what we're talking about here, we're talking about not only premier uh human rights groups in Palestine, right? I mean, a group like Al-Haq has been around for four decades. They're actually the best of global society, uh, civil society. I mean, when you look at models of human rights organizing, you know, in the Middle East, in outside of Europe and the United States, Al-Haq is one of the kind of, uh, you know, shining lights we look at, right? In terms of being rooted in universal values and international law committed um, to these sorts of principles. So we're talking about designating human rights organizations as terrorists and unlawful associations and shutting them down, saying that the evidence is secret and saying, well, you can challenge, you know, this designation in a, a process that lacks any sort of legitimacy. So when you put that context there, you can understand why some groups don't want to go through the charade. And by the way, even those groups in the West Bank that did challenge designation, of course, the answer returned with it's confirmed. And you're right, all the power in the West Bank for 55 years has been vested with, you know, the Israeli army. 
right, which controls the lives of millions of Palestinians who have no say over the government that rules over them, right? And technically, that government should only make decisions under international law that are either in the welfare of the, the occupied population or for their own security interests. But yet we see them regulating every aspect of Palestinian lives, not for the, that rationale, but in service of a, a government plan that spans from the river to the sea to maintain the domination by Jewish uh, Israelis over Palestinians. And certainly when you understand that framework, uh, you understand you know, what's happening here, right? Um, and at the same time that this is you know, criminalized the Israeli government every day. And we have recent Supreme Court cases that say, you know, uh, if you act in good faith and stole land from Palestinians, we're not going to turn a blind eye. That's okay, right? And and that's not just a policy in the West Bank. That's also how much of the land in Israel is overtaken. We could go on and on, but the bottom line here is when you understand that basic reality, um, of apartheid, you can understand, you know, these these processes and these decisions which underlie every aspect of Palestinians lives. Thanks. And and you mentioned that the the organizations and their lawyers sought to see the evidence. I, I want to actually sort of come to that. And, you know, one of the things I think that's important is to look at what the international responses have been over the past 10 months to these designations, because Israel went on a a, a designation tour right around the designations they took dossiers of evidence to european governments because they want to convince the european governments to stop partnering with these groups stop funding them and they brought the designation the information they brought to congress and they brought the, a, a dossier which my understanding is was even bigger than what they brought to congress to the u.s administration now the u.s the u.s doesn't fund any of these groups the goal there was clearly to get the u.s to join in in declaring these groups to be terrorists and I will say, you know, from the U.S. side, the Biden administration refrained from doing so, which I think makes a strong case that they saw through the evidence. And, you know, it, it, it's it, it's very difficult to believe that the Biden administration has in hand smoking gun evidence and chose not to designate. There's never been a hesitation on the side of the U.S. government to designate terrorist or to designate Palestinians as terrorists or Palestinian organizations as terrorist organizations. The fact that they didn't speaks volumes, but they also chose not to do anything affirmatively to fight back. Can you talk about what the Europeans and, and as partners did, and also maybe foundations, funders, other NGOs in the sector, Israeli and international, over the past 10 months as they have either faced or indirectly contended with these allegations and this evidence? Yeah, so let's maybe take that in a, in a few different ways. I think, you know, we sort of maybe can take global civil society funders, we can take uh, Europe, and we can sort of take the US maybe in order. I think starting with global civil society, I think we've seen an outpouring of support for these organizations, right? And I think that's come far and wide, civil society groups from the United States, from Europe, from the global south, from international human rights groups. I think you've seen an outpouring of people saying we stand with these organizations. And by the way, that comes in, you know, in the face of, because there are also legal risks risks for expressing support for such organizations and also legal representation for the organizations, which is another, another. So I think there's been quite an outpouring of support for the organizations. You can find statements galore issued by every sort of respected human rights, civil society organization out there, and not just groups that are Israel-Palestine focused, but much, much more broadly. You've seen letters from like the American Bar Association. You've seen all sorts of different uh, groups and organizations who looked at the facts and, you know, saw this for what it is, you know, which is an effort by a repressive government to muzzle the work of critical human rights organizations. We know that playbook from other parts of the world. In Europe, we saw a much slower response. So for months and months, you, you, you heard the platitudes, you know, issued by European governments that they're waiting to sort of see the quote unquote evidence uh, and make their own determination and repeating some general line about global, uh, you know, the importance of global civil society, right? More recently, uh, you know, we had we had some a breakthrough where you had uh, nine European states issue a joint statement in essence rejecting the 
Israeli government's claims against the groups and making clear that they felt the quote unquote evidence was not substantiated and that, that they would continue to fund the organizations. In parallel, uh, you had the European Commission for, for a long while, not directly related to the designations, having to do in part with politics there, including an Orban designee running the shop that had frozen funding for, for Al Haq, one of the, you know, one of the organizations. That was also uh, more recently um, undone. Now, it's not a uniform story. You know, there have been other developments, for example, in the Netherlands with uh, a decision it made regarding one of the organizations with a certain, uh, with some small um, uh, particular funds in different areas. But the overarching story in Europe has been a long period of review and quiet and more recent statements that have distanced themselves from the Israeli allegation. That said, of course, even the European response, even the most recent response is clearly, clearly not enough, right? It is, uh, you know, it's a standalone statement. Um, it was done in, 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 in a way that did not, you know, very clearly call for, uh, you know, the Israeli government to reverse its decision, right? Um, you know, it did not unequivocally make clear that it disregards, uh, you know, uh, and considers it to be null and void. It did not um, you know, indicate what sort of action it would take in the future should these next steps, you know, be followed. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, so I think it's important to note that it was an important step, but much, much more could be done. Again, look at what the international community has done uh, in regards to situations like Ukraine much more broadly. There's a whole set of tools in the toolkit, um, you know, that could be brought to bear when it comes to complicity and is Israeli abuses and sort of more. And, and there's, you know, we have an associational council meeting that's happening, that's being put back on the calendar after years of being it, of, of it being deferred. So again, warming relations with the Israeli government, almost siloing this issue to like uh, on the side and, 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 and separating it from the otherwise close relations with the Israeli government. So that doesn't exist for other countries that commit crimes against humanity and ruthlessly repress um, human rights defenders. Well, you know, maybe we need to caveat that with what's happening in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere. But generally, it's, there's an inconsistency there. And then in the U.S. And in the U.S., I think you, you summarized it well, right? On one hand, yes, the United States government has not uh, you know, seconded uh, the you know, publicly back the Israeli government's designation, but that's a very, very low bar, right? We're talking about a government that claims to be committed to protection of human rights, uh, you know, across the globe, and you have a clear situation. Um, and as you said, if the evidence even remotely had had been, um, and let's be clear, there's been some reporting in the press, leaked dossiers of what the quote unquote evidence amounts to, and it's it's a lot of nothing. You know, it is, uh, you know, attenuated general claims by people that were in detention that were uh, likely subjected to mistreatment and torture. I mean, it's it's nothing you would call real serious credible evidence. But the Biden administration has been embarrassingly, shamefully, uh, you know, silent. Uh, you know, on these issues, and they had an opportunity with Biden's visit to, you know, show support for Palestinian civil society that didn't take place. And, and, uh, and I think what, what they how they react in the coming days will be very telling. We've seen some action in Congress, there was a, you know, a letter circulated that had some sign ons, there's been some, you know, movement there. Um, we need more, frankly, I mean, we've seen the way in which, for example, in the killing of Shireen Abu Akhla, congressional voices did, you know, at least create some sort of push on the on the Biden administration. Again, even there, we haven't gone very far, but I think the idea here is um, the United States, this is, I think, an existential threat for Palestinian civil society. And uh, the U.S. role here is 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 critical, and 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 it's critical that they, the U.S. ambassador, should tomorrow, um, you know, go, uh, you know, go uh, meet with these organizations, or or let's maybe not say the ambassador, at least some diplomatic representation at a high level should signal support. You know, it needs to come from Ned Price. It needs to come from uh, a much uh, uh, broader swath of voices, um, because otherwise, I think we're headed in a very dark, dark place. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I think is is clear, you know, having talked to colleagues here in Washington and in Europe, there, there seems to be a sense that there was sort of hope that that designation would have just sat there and nothing else would be done, right? Which which seems to me to be just absolutely delusional. I I I, I referred in a in a series of tweets earlier today to Chekhov's gun. I mean, Israel put the gun on the table in the first act. The idea that it's just going to sit there and never get fired 
it is not just wishful thinking, it, it is delusional. The, the challenge though, is that now that it actually has been taken out, aimed and they're starting to fire, the political investment required <laughs> to get it put away is a lot, a lot higher. And I guess the question is like looking at the past 24 hours, I mean, this is really just happening now in real time. Gantz's um, statement was yesterday afternoon, Israel time. And then we had the, the raids today at dawn and it's just people are starting to just kind of come to terms with this. Can you talk about the, the response that we've seen so far from diplomats to the extent that there's been any responses from governments? Um, what, what does that look like so far? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I think there was an important step in that a number of diplomats from um, mainly European countries, but there were some others as well, visited uh, the offices of Al Haq and met with the organizations. Um, there was subsequently a tweet uh, that went up by um, by the EU um, that in, EU and Palestinians that I think reiterated the European position uh, regarding the organizations. Uh, you know, that was significant, right? You've had a number of states who have sort of re-upped and reinforced. Uh, you know that that message, um, and I think you had states there that included uh, Denmark, Spain, Italy, Finland, uh, Sweden, Norway, Chile, Mexico, EU, France, Belgium, Ireland, Netherlands, Poland, the UK, Germany, Switzerland. So you had a number of states there. That's something. Let's not undermine that. In the fact, they did so in the same day. They visited them. I think that's important, and those states should be credited. Uh, you know, for doing so, right? Um, you know, but at the same time, uh, and so we've seen that happen. We, the U.S. response, I think, we're still waiting to see. Uh, so we'll see what transpires in the coming, uh, you know, hours of that. But I think, uh, you know, probably states need, uh, need to be doing some real thinking here, right? About, um, you know, what the next steps are, and that must, that should include much stronger statements. Um, that are uh, clearly calling for the designation because you you put it really well, Lara. Right, like this is the classic Israeli government playbook. Right, they take a step, you know, they change the goalposts. So the governments, you know, maybe they, you know, they didn't say, as we said, even the European, they didn't say revoke. Right, so the Israeli government maybe lulled maybe they even said we won't act on them and then even though by the way even putting aside this decision there are members of these organizations today that are in detention uh human rights watch wrote just the other day about salah Hamouri, who not only works for Adamir, one of the organizations designated not only was his device hacked by pegasus not only did the israeli government just days before the designation revoke his legal status in jerusalem by the way all based on the same set of uh, nothing evidence, all secret also, and links to the PFLP, the kind of new boogeyman for these organizations, but also has, an, has administratively detained him without trial or charge since March, right? So you have members of the organizations that are already in detention. Others have received travel bans, um, not being allowed to leave. And so you look at the kind of um, kinds of actions that are already being taken, and it's quite clear, um, you know, where this could go. And so I think many states need to understand the need to up their rhetoric, but also to take meaningful action, because otherwise, we're going to go through step three and step four of this, you're going to wake up one morning, and it's going to be the heads of these organizations in detention, it's going to be bank accounts that are inaccessible. And what's the game plan there? Unfortunately, too often, when there are these sort of moments in Israel-Palestine, you know, you, you put out a statement, you put out a quote, not, there's not follow-up, the Israeli government wades it out and takes the next step and the goalposts change again. And uh, that cycle is why we're here today. It's the decades-long failure of the international community to meaningfully challenge Israel, the Israeli government's grave abuses, it's apartheid, it's it's persecution of rights defenders, and impose any sorts of consequences. And that's why you continue to go down this path. And every day brings a new story of this. Earlier this week, Lara, we were talking about the Israeli government just, you know, officials admitting they killed five Palestinian kids in Gaza after saying it was a rocket attack. We saw the same playbook with Shireen Abu Akhla. I mean, we every, it's just at what point do you step, take a step back and say the international community's response needs to be recalibrated for the reality of a government committing crimes against humanity, uh, you know, methodically silencing those that stand in its way. There's a disconnect that needs to be addressed. I think, I think that's really well said. I, I want to talk a little bit more about the escalation that, you know, that one of the challenges, I think, for a lot of us working on 
Palestinian rights is that we warn of what is coming and people treat it as hysterical and exaggerating. And then when it happens, it's like, well, A, you don't ever get credit for having been right. And B, it doesn't make anyone take you more seriously when you warn of the next thing. I, I think it's important, you know, it was clear in October that this is where things were headed, that the goal was to shut down these organizations and lay the groundwork for targeting their official, their, their, their senior staff to have chilling effect on their operations, et cetera, et cetera. Can you um, just, as someone who, who follows human rights organizations and threats to them worldwide, can you talk about what that escalation looks like in terms of threats to personnel associated directly with these organizations who, by the way, live under occupation and don't have any legal rights at all effectively. Can you talk about what it means in terms of their funding, much of their funding coming from European governments, from foreign, from foreign sources? Can you talk about what it means for the status of their funders? who under Israeli law now potentially run afoul of the terrorism law, and, and also what it means for their partners and defenders. And here I'm thinking very much about their partners on the other side of the green line, both Israeli Jewish organizations and organizations that are led by Palestinian citizens of Israel. Because over the past 10 months, one of the things that we've seen increasingly is that when, one, when someone wants to attack an organization inside Israel that's critical of, of, of the Israeli government, they, they bring out their association with one of these NGOs in the West Bank. Right, That's used to try to discredit them in the eyes of the international community, in the eyes of international partners. Can you talk about what as the door is opened wider, what HRW as an organization that defends human rights is watching for and warning of. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right, Laura, to say that, you know, it's 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 too easy for states to say, well, you know, they issued this decision, but they, they you know, they need to do it. We, they need to, we need to have them save face. You often hear this in meetings with diplomats, like we need to give them a way to save face. It's like, you know, that's you know, the sort of calculation you use for a government that, uh, you know, you uh, uh, you have friendly relations with, you think generally does well and maybe made a mistake, but that's not the reality we're dealing with. Look, I've seen this playbook before. I covered Egypt for Human Rights Watch, uh, and I was there, you know, when I we saw a similar pattern, right, where, you know, first you had killings of protesters and mass arrests of Muslim Brotherhood protesters, and then suddenly it shifted to journalists, including Jazeera journalists, but well, they're sympathetic to them and then suddenly you had the like you know liberal uh but the people on the street activist and then you had the human rights organizations and i mean it's just it's just a playbook you see everywhere when where when you sort of put a green light up you know when when a government does something in the case of egypt it was the rabah massacre you know, gunning down you know uh, over 800 people in 12 hours and that they face no real meaningful consequences for it. And when they got away with all these arrests and then they notice, right, when you just, you know, when you, uh, all the focus then becomes on the one or two that the, you know, five or 10 names that are known in Western capitals and you release one of them and suddenly the pressure's off on the thousands of other ones. So I, let's be clear, this isn't an Israel specific uh, you know, policy, but it's a trend you see everywhere else. But certainly we see it, um, you know, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, right? And, and, and Laura, I'll, you know, I'll remind you when, I, when the Israeli government deported me uh, in November of 2019 over our human rights advocacy, um, I, I, you know, I think I said to, to you, maybe one of your programs and elsewhere that, um, you know, this is a step towards a reality in which they criminalize human rights work in Israel, Palestine, right? And that's not because I had some, you know, hyperbolic, you know, or I'm, a, I'm actually an optimist, you know, but but it was quite clear the road they were going on, right? And, and of course, we've seen what's happened. But forget even that. Look what happened uh, less than two weeks ago. A staff member of B'Tselem, an Israeli human rights uh, organization, was detained for 14 hours and basically told that this was about their reporting. Yes, he was a Palestinian member of B'Tselem, right? But again, you see the kind of goalposts changing and moving, right? And, and it, uh, you, you can look at anything, right? Look at the Israeli government in boycott, right? And look at their, you know, their 2011, they passed a law saying civil 
fees can be levied against those who call for boycotts. And then 2017, you see a decision to instruct denial of entry for boycott activists. And then two years later, they deport me, a representative of an organization that takes no position you know, on boycotts for doing that. And now we're even seeing efforts to um, you know, strip Jerusalem residents uh, of their residency status for breach of loyalty. And looking at it, and there's a Supreme Court case from this year of stripping citizenship for breach of loyalty, right? So it's like- And for, for people who are interested in that, I did a podcast with Lena Tatur about exactly that Supreme Court case a couple of weeks ago. I still think not enough people are paying attention to it, especially when you had an Israeli right-wing MK, I believe this week, calling for the deportation of disloyal Israeli citizens. Um, I think there's a, a, a an overarching story here that's being missed. And that and those disloyal citizens were actually members of the Knesset, right? So you know, if if, they, if they're going to talk that way about Knesset members, you can imagine the ordinary, uh, you know, Israeli citizen that you know had the misfortune of being born Palestinian. So again, you know, you put it all together, Laura, and you see clearly where these things are going, right? And so you come back to this question of, and, and you mentioned just so I, so I address that part of your question, Israeli, um, you know, uh, the Israelis that stand with these organizations already, the the Michael Sfard and some of the other Israeli lawyers, Adala, that represent some of the organizations have been more or less threatened, um, you know, with potential sanction under Israeli law, uh, you know, for what they're doing. And that still remains to be played out. But there's, you know, the, you know, and that's still being sort of discussed within the Israeli government. But um, this law authorizes sanctions for those who express support for the organizations, right? So that could, you know, there have been many Israeli human rights organizations that have stood, issued statements, gone to the offices in solidarity, Israeli journalists, Israeli activists. So those people are at risk, internationals are at risk. And Laura, we, we even talk about, you know, the other side of all this, which is these new guidelines that the Israeli army wants to impose that will restrict access for internationals and um, Palestinians with other citizenship entering, you know, the West Bank. And that's another effort to essentially turn the West Bank into, which we haven't talked about yet either, Gaza, right? Where the human rights organizations there, they might not be criminalized, but they're basically walled off in an open air prison without access to their colleagues in uh, international organizations and others who are not allowed to enter. So again, you put all of these things together and you see a pretty stark, dark reality. And by the way, let's remember, we're talking about a Lapid, you know, Bennett government. This is not even what we could be facing, uh, you know, come come November. So um, it is a dark picture, but I think we have to start looking at these things together. And that's part of the reason why there is a consensus today in the human rights movement that the Israeli government is committing apartheid. We need to call it by its name, because when you understand that context of structural violence and apartheid that millions of Palestinians face, when you understand that this is a well-oiled machine that's geared to privileging one people at the expense of another, you can start to understand how these puzzle pieces fit together in service of that larger aim. But when you forget that, when you either bury your head in the sand or want to deal with each thing as a standalone issue, you allow the Israeli government to steamroll over you and create and solidify its, its, its cruel system of apartheid. Yeah, I, I think that's really important as context. I, I, I always come back to this question. I, I, I have these discussions with friends on, on what, is, what is law, what is legal. And, and you know, it, anyone who watches Israeli policy vis-a-vis -vis the West Bank, we don't even go inside the Green Line, vis-a-vis -vis the West Bank, the Israeli Knesset, the Israeli legal system is essentially set up to find ways to make legal anything Israel wants to do, including literally erasing the principle of property ownership in order to permit settlers to stay on land that even Israel owns is privately owned by Palestinians. They have created an entire new section of law, essentially an entire new concept in law to make that legal while finding ways to legally um, dispossess Palestinians of, of, of what are, I think, fundamental rights as seen by the international community and certainly of, of their, their status and, and, and property. Um, I wanna take a step back a little bit. You said, I think correctly very much, that this is not an Israel specific problem. This is Israel is just you know one, one symptom of, of a bigger problem. Can you talk about, and, and I wanna link this to Israel, 
it is clear, I tweeted a thread about this back in October about all the different illiberal governments in the world that are using anti-terror laws, anti-whatever laws to go after the NGOs that they don't like because they criticize them, right? We will find that hook to say, you are not a legitimate NGO and we will shut you down, we'll do it legally. Um, those are all illiberal, non-democratic countries. Can you talk about what it means to have an ostensibly democratic country that is part of the community of nations and sits as the you know, closest ally of the United States and all of the all of the privileges it demands by calling itself a democracy when that country is doing all of these things? What does that mean in terms of giving a, a kosher stamp and a green light to these practices more broadly? Yeah, I mean, I would uh, start by quoting my good friend Hagai al Ad, the executive director of Betselem, who wrote in a piece several years ago that democracy uh, is uh, rule of the people, not the rule of one people over another. So I think we need to, uh, you know, call a spade a spade, right? Um, you know, democracy is not, uh, you know, a government that, you know, rules over an area where two people uh, live and where it methodically privileges one, uh, one people and systematically represses the other. Right. I think the Israel, you know, Israel can say what it wants to say, but the reality is it is a government that is in committing crimes against humanity, against millions of people because of who they are. A people that uh, you know, cages Palestine, two million Palestinians in Gaza, that deprives Palestinians and the millions of Palestinians in the West Bank of their civil rights because of who they are, cages people in Gaza because of who they are, that makes Palestinians who are born Israeli citizens have an inferior legal status because of who they are, who denies millions of Palestinians, who in some cases live live kilometers away from Israel's border from entering while allowing all foreigner, you know, many foreigners to do so because of who they are. So, I mean, yeah, certainly like, you know, actions like this um, embolden, right, other governments to do the same kind of things, right? But I think Israel, um, you know, belongs in the ranks of those other repressive governments. It, 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 and, and in fact, you can argue, you know, the other way that maybe the actions of, you know, Russia and others, you know, embolden Israel to continue down its path. So I think putting that caveat aside, right, I think it's important to understand that we're in a moment globally where you know human rights um, advocates are, are are under attack and we see similar inconsistencies with US policy and human rights activists in Egypt and Saudi Arabia and in so many different um, you know parts of the world and I think frankly um, you know it, it's actually concerning because you know one of the reasons, uh, many governments in the Arab world have taken steps to normalize relations with Israel is because they hope it earns them a free pass when it comes to their own repression. In the case of Morocco, their own occupation of Western Sahara. In the case of these other countries, you know, they're really serious human rights abuses. Can those be sort of put to the side because we're taking these, uh, you know, sort of empty gestures to make public their long, uh, you know, quiet relationships among repressive governments. So, you know, I think it's important to sort of um, understand, you know, that this is a universal trend and that certainly when governments do it um, and they get away with doing it, it, it weakens the ability of all of us to push because, you know, there's a clear example of somebody, other government doing it and getting a free pass. So it's, you know, it's, it, when there are inconsistencies like this uh, well, on anything, right, whether it's accountability, whether it's human rights defenders, whether it's application of international law, it just makes it too easy for us to then accept a reality in which instead of um, aspiring for a global standard, we end up going down to the lowest common denominator, which tends to be um, acquiescence uh, to injustice, human rights abuse, and repression. Absolutely. I think that you said it perfectly. Thank you for that. Um, I want to end with, you said you're an optimist. I think that I am, I am hopeful. I'm not optimistic, but I think it's important to end with, you know, looking ahead. Um, you know, last October, Human Rights Watch said, and I'm quoting, how the international community responds to the designations will be a true test of its resolve to protect human rights defenders. So um, you've talked about what's happened so far. I'm curious how, from an HRW perspective, you feel the world has fared in facing this test. And more importantly, maybe, what, what do they need to be doing now? This test, the 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 stakes have have just been raised, right? This is now the 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 final. This is your whole grade, right? It's not yeah. you don't get it. There's no essay to follow. There's no extra credit. Your whole grade is here. What what do they need to do to pass this test now? 
Yeah, I, I think it's a good question because, you know, uh, and I think the way you did it, is, the way you framed it is right, right? It's, you know, it's if you want to go with the analogy, right? You know, frankly, the international community has, um, you know, has has largely failed that test, right? You know, depending on, you know, how you want to grade different, you know, different states, I would say, you know, when it comes to governments, the grade would be somewhere between a C and an F, right? You know, uh, probably an F reserved for the United States. Um, and, you know, European countries somewhere in the D to C uh, side of the pendulum, maybe some of them would get to B minus territory, right? Because, you know, um, you, you had, we, we said it was a true test, because every government says, that you know, virtually every government, let's say, says that they value or prioritize protecting human rights defenders or the space. Freedom. I can't tell you how many meetings I've been in with governments say, "Look, we can't go with you on you know um, concrete action or calling it apartheid or even." But you know, when it comes to human rights defenders, we're there. You know, because we believe the work you do is critical. So you know, it's one thing to say that; it's another thing to stick to it. Um, and principally defend it when it's under attack, right? You know, it's, you know, the, as I think uh, the Martin Luther King goes, the true test of your principles is how, how you deal with in times of challenge and controversy, right? And, and, and clearly states have failed to do that. They took too long, uh, especially in the case of Europe and in the case of the U.S., not really there yet, uh, to condemn uh, these designations, or let's say distance it themselves from these designations. But that was it. You know, the statements were ra rather shallow. And there was nothing in their statements or their actions that indicated to the Israeli government that they would face any sort of consequence if they acted further on it. As you noted, Laura, I think that, that this was a bit of a trial balloon for the Israeli government, right? You know, they had the opportunity to um, recalibrate if, if they got a big pushback, right? I mean, they could have revoked it or they could have just let them sit. The fact that now, 10 months later, and by the way, this comes less, you know, like a month after the, Euro the nine European states and the 10 state followed them, you know, sort of distance themselves from the allegation, they did this, shows that they're not really concerned that there will be any sort of action from the international community. The bluff has been called, right? And again, not to go back to, you know, previous events, but when I was being deported, we said the exact same thing, that if this is allowed to pass, you know, and it's Human Rights Watch, it's this known it covers 100 countries. What does that mean for the local civil society groups for which they're not as well known, for which they're not as well, um, you know, uh, a household name in many of these countries? So I think the international community has really um, so far done badly. Now, can they make it up? Yeah, I mean, if you hit a, you know, if you get an A plus or an A, you can get your grade up there, right? But now the, the, the challenge is that much harder, right? Because your statements or your, like, we would have been very happy if the day of the designation, all the diplomats went to meet and they issued the statements they issued today. But now that's not enough, right? Because, you know, that didn't stop this decision. So there has to be a much stronger repudiation rhetorically of these decisions. And then there must be actions. There needs to be countermeasures. There needs to be a clear signaling that, you know, that there will be uh, action taken against Israel, should they continue um, down this path? Should they not, let's say, not even just not continue down this path, should they not go back to where they were, including, um, you know, uh, reevaluating, you know, bilateral relations, um, you know, the associational council meeting that's on the agenda. There's all sorts of levers. And it's not even about sanctions as much as it is just removing some of the, you know, the many perks in, in the relationship between Europe and, and, the, and, and, uh, and, and Israel, right? We certainly Certainly saw some of that happen uh, in other contexts when 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 you know when Russia invaded Ukraine when uh, Jamal Khashoggi was killed again not comparing different events but the point is we know that governments uh, are capable when there's political will of um, signaling their uh, uh, their disapproval and making clear what the consequences are. This is one of those moments. So, so far, Laura, they've done very badly uh, in their preliminary you know, exams. They have a big one coming up today, uh, today in the days ahead, let's say weeks ahead. Um, and unless we see a pretty dramatic reversal, you're gonna probably have me on again in weeks or months. And we're gonna be talking about detentions, freezing of banking accounts, shutting down of civil society groups, uh, and I really hope we don't, we're, we're not, as much as I love talking to you, I really hope I'm not on next time to discuss that. Well, I, I'd love to have you on again, hopefully to discuss how things are being rolled back. That, that'd that be wonderful, but we will have you on either way because we appreciate your insights and analysis. 
We're going to have to stop here. Um, Omar, thank you for joining us today and again sharing your vast expertise and insight with us on this very challenging day for our audience. Thank you for listening and watching. Again, I will post with this podcast links to um, the resource page from last time around, all the stuff we did on that, and to some of the stuff happening now. I would encourage people to follow Omar on Twitter. Um, Omar, what is your Twitter handle? I don't have it in front of uh, me. Omar S. Shacker. There you go. Uh, follow him on Twitter to follow things that are happening on a moment by moment basis. You can also follow me. I tweet about this pretty obsessively. Um, and finally, as always, I want to remind you to subscribe to the Occupied Thoughts podcast. We have lots of great content. There will be more on this. You can do that on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Spotify. That way you don't miss anything. And you can also uh, listen to them and watch the videos on our website, www.fmep.org. Uh, and with that, we're going to end it here. I'm Lara Friedman, president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace, signing off until the next episode of Occupied Thoughts. <laughs>